from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. Today on the show, we take personality tests. Spoiler alert, two of them came back negative. <laughs> And now, broadcasting from the churn, that guy's Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. Time for some pot therapy. Can we just reflect and on the, the other fact? one said, no thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Three years we've been doing this podcast. We're about to celebrate our third anniversary in January of 2021. You have gotten really funny. I'm going to give you the credit. No. You have always no. done our intros from, from Jump. In fact, that's where the name of our show came from, was from the first intro you ever wrote for the show. Because at the time, on the way to the studio to record it, our show was going to be called something else. Sun City Shrinks. Yep. And then you recorded, or, or you, you read out loud, or I think you gave me your script, and you were driving us to the studio. And I was reading through your intro that you had written, and you would said, it's time for some pod therapy. Yeah. And I was like, huh. That makes more sense. That makes more sense. Because <laughs> we were having this ongoing debate about whether the word shrink was still relevant, you know, past 1950. Right. And if anybody actually would have a clue what it was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And we were like, is, is us being from Vegas really the most interesting thing? Like, not necessarily. And we're, you know, are people going to understand what shrinks are? And there's like pod therapy. And we were both laughing about how plain that was. Right. It's a podcast about therapy. Show's called Pod, Pod Therapy. therapy. Yeah. yeah. There's no pizzazz. You know what you're walking into. And, and yeah, that was your very first joke. It turned out to be the title of the show. Your shit is funny, Nick. Oh. You are surprisingly funny. Yeah, who'd have thought? And if people want to find out about your other amazing creative talents, they can go to patreon.com slash therapy and discover that you can draw. Apparently, I'll give you a hint. You can dremel vegetables. The other talents involve pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now they're not going to pledge any sponsorship. <laughs> also, I think pumpkins are fruits. <laughs> yeah. No. They have seeds. Yeah. What, vegetables don't have seeds? Not inside of them. Tomatoes do. Tomatoes, Tomatoes are fruit. fruit. You guys are full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> You're idiots. <laughs> they got tomatoes are fruit. A tomato. tomato is a fruit. <laughs> it's not. What are you talking about? Yes, tomato is a fruit. No, it's not. <laughs> wait, wait, a tomato. What are we betting? A tomato. A Everybody. tomato. <laughs> Nick, shut up. Think what about are, a Jim, tomato. What are, we, what are we betting? You're telling me a tomato. What are we betting? Not a vegetable. What are we betting? I, I don't. Money. I'll put money on it. I'll, I'll put five bucks each. Oh, what do I five got bucks in my each. Deal. Let's go fivers. Let's go I think fivers. I can do five. You're saying a yeah. tomato. A tomato. A tomato. Tomato. Think about a garden. What's in that garden, Nick? Tomatoes are in that garden. Vegetables grow in gardens. Okay, <laughs> that's where the vegetables. <laughs> where, grow. where do strawberries grow? Uh, farms. Oh. <laughs> what did I get it her to repeat it? Say what? What is, is that? Alexa or is... that's Google. I do trust Google. Is tomato a fruit? That silence Come you're on. hearing is the my suspense. confirmation. I think it's just confused because she's like, I, you just asked me that and I answered. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Is a tomato a vegetable? No, tomato is a fruit. Boom. What the fuck? <laughs> There's something very suspicious Look at about this. Read, read the screen. On yeah, the phone. screen. It's it very yes. rare when you Google something <laughs> that it just says no. <laughs> That's all it the says. Screen on my phone it literally says, says no. yes, tomato Look, is a fruit. <laughs> yeah. Mine just says, I said, is a tomato vegetable? And it just literally puts up a white like wall with no, black text. Idiot. No. <laughs> <laughs> a tomato is a fruit. A tomato is a fruit? Yes. yes. Why? General that rule doesn't... of thumb, if there are seeds inside of it, it's a fruit. That's the definition of a fruit? Definitely not. <laughs> That's a general rule of thumb. So wait a minute. A pickle is a fruit. A pickle well, be is a cucumber. A, a cucumber. Cucumber's a fruit. Which is a fruit. Bullshit. <laughs> I want, I'm not putting more money on it. Another five? Hold on. No, no, no. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Double or nothing. Is a, is a cucumber a fruit? Yeah. Uh, Siri just said, yes, a cucumber is a fruit. Are you freaking kidding Jim's me? Jim's world is upside down. <laughs> you I'm... guys are okay with this? <laughs> Like, you just knew that. You just walk around yes. in your life and you just knew that. Yes. Cucumbers, I mean, tomatoes, okay, one and my, pumpkins? One of my all-time favorite sayings, quotes, I can't remember. Maybe this was anonymous. Maybe it was attributed to somebody. I don't remember. 
but they're talking about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> And they say, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's Penn, actually, that has said in, in the past that uh, tomato is a fruit, but it's treated like a vegetable. Yeah. Okay. All right. And a pumpkin is a fruit? Yes. Yeah. So. It's like a squash is a fruit? What the hell's a, a vegetable, has... then? <laughs> Broccoli. <laughs> yeah. Broccoli was engineered by scientists. It does not even occur in nature on its own. I don't care. <laughs> That's, that was not the question. <sighs> I feel like that's just arbitrary. This is, uh, this is great for our listeners because this Welcome is... Welcome to our therapy this show. Is, no, this is, uh, this is 100% Patreon. <laughs> oh, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. If you're wondering <laughs> what goes on behind the veil of the first hour, this we, we record... It. This yeah, is it. <laughs> you've been listening to Thursdays, and it's a one-hour therapy show. If you go to patreon.com slash therapy... There's an additional hour that we take before every episode, and it's mostly this. It's this a is, lot of vegetable is, talk. <laughs> well, more than you'd expect. It's not zero. Oh, my uh, gosh. Well, all right, fine. So apparently I owe everybody money now. <sighs> you know, and I swore off betting on this show a while ago. <laughs> yeah, it's never I worked did. for you. I know. <laughs> oh, pretty soon we're going to find out if I won Best yes, of Las Vegas. by the time this airs, right? No, when this airs, it'll be, I think this comes out like the first December week of December. 2nd, I think. Yeah, I think I find out like mid-December. Oh. So, oh, crossing my That's fingers. That's disappointing. Yep. And before we jump into the uh, the questions of the show, dadvicebook.com. Go to dadvicebook.com and help me out. I wrote my very first book. It took me a long time. It's not a long book. It's only 10 bucks. Dadvicebook.com. It's called Dad Vice, 50 Fatherly Life Lessons. And uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, help boost me this first week. Help me uh, get up there in the rankings so that I can get one of those cool, like, little stickers that says Amazon bestseller. And I can say I'm a best-selling author on Amazon. That would be awesome. So buy a copy. Give one mm-hmm. to everybody you know. Buy one for Jacob and Nick because they're not going to buy one. So buy them and send them it's to just me. true. <laughs> <laughs> these, are not, these are not false. Actually, I have a table at home that needs to be stabilized. <laughs> it depends on how many pages are in yeah. there. I yeah. can bring you a shim. <laughs> <laughs> Bring you a wooden block. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. They sell those for like 50 cents. I've got, I've got wooden blocks laying around. Yeah. I'm I'm just lousy with them. Dremel them. <laughs> it down to size. All right. Well, we've got a good question here about personality tests uh, that actually caused all three of us to go take it. Uh, here's the question. Hi, guys. My employer is making everyone take the DISC, D-I-S-C, personality test. And I'm concerned about these types of tests Lacking scientific evidence and I want to know about your employer. I know. Like, where are they doing that? What do you think of these tests? And is there a possibility that my employer could use the results in a way that would negatively impact employees? I am concerned that this could be used against employees in a discriminatory way. Best regards, Lindsay B. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll dive into our results in a second because we all took this disc test, but we took like the diet version of it, like on we some random. Way. Yeah, we did not you, pay you the can, money. You can take the test and you can uh, pay fifteen dollars to buy an extended report. Yeah, which, which we're we not doing. Refused it. <laughs> and I'll tell you, Lindsay, I was not very impressed. You know, I, I thought it was an interesting test. Like the test. So the idea of the test, then we'll talk about whether it's even proper for organizations to necessarily be using it. But the idea of the test, the the disc D I S C. Uh, It stands for four words, dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. And apparently uh, these four factors get measured as you do these these little quartets of questions. It'll it'll give you a thumbs up and a thumbs down symbol. And uh, there'll be these quartets of questions. And it'll say, of these four, put one of them as a thumbs up because it really applies to you. Put one of them as a thumbs down because it definitely doesn't. And you have to always pick one of each type in, in each quartet of questions. Right. And there's probably like, I don't know, 20 or 30 quartets. So the one we did. So it wants a, it wants a, a most applicable and a least applicable out of, the four, right. out of the four things. And you're supposed to do it quickly. They said that too. I did it while driving. So I feel mine was definitely quick. Okay. <laughs> I did it while <laughs> recording the uh, Patreon portion of the last episode <laughs> and watching a football game. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I feel like mine is, mine is a good Results assessment. may vary. Yeah. 
<laughs> was I the only one that got in a quiet room with yeah. no distractions to complete this test? Did this take you as long yes. as your pumpkin did? I think that says a lot right there about the personality. I'm telling you, the personality <laughs> test doesn't need the answers. I did it while having a, while having a conversation with two people yeah. and watching a football game. You know what's funny? The way all three of us took the test is probably going to tell us a lot about the results. Actually, I'm really yeah. excited now to hear everybody's yeah. results to see if it actually corresponds. So yeah, the the disc is something that I've heard of a lot. I think in the I only ever see the disc show up in professional environments. I never see the disc used for any therapeutic purpose. I don't know any colleagues who are like, "Oh man, I, I see a lot of value in that." It's also not super common that we really care about personality tests. It's it's more of a gimmick. Um sometimes we do it if we think there's some value to it. It's super right. super rare. I think the only reason that this kind of crap exists, like even Myers-Briggs and junk like that, I'll bet you the disc is way more uh, valuable than the Myers-Briggs. So Myers-Briggs is all garbage. It is garbage. It has no scientific bearing. It is a horoscope. It is a gimmick. It just helps you, like, label yourself with certain adjectives, which is fine, and people find that to be rewarding and illustrative. People love adjectives. That's fine. <laughs> Great. The, the problem comes with this religious dogmatism that, like, you know, people are I would are say it... people enthusiastically love adjectives. I think that they, oh, oh, I see what you did there. Wait, is that an adverb? That's, that's an adverb. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, why I shut my eyes at last. Idiot. <laughs> ha! You moron. Go, go back to School of Rock, or whatever yeah. that thing was. Schoolhouse Rock? I'm going home. Yeah, you should go home. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. Go home and dremel something. <laughs> enthusiastically. Oh. What were we talking about? Vic is having a day. <laughs> He is having a day. This has been the worst <laughs> podcast day of my life. Oh, don't worry. Nick has been there will be worse. On several things, and Jim tricked him earlier today. He didn't lose money on betting on fruit. That's true. I didn't <laughs> say you had a good day. <laughs> yeah, I think we're both setting records. <laughs> Myers Briggs is garbage. It has no scientific bearing, but people get so enthusiastic about its ability to sort of sorting hat them into different houses that they literally put it on their dating profile and they go, like, oh, "I'm an INFJ or whatever." So the disc they is. Do? Oh yes, I have so many I people that do that. that. I've had people introduce themselves in therapy with their initials and, and like, try to tell me what – and I'm like, great. Can I just learn your story now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, learn who you are for myself. I'll be the personality test. How about that? So the disc – I've had um, patients – It's a weird comeback. Yeah. I'll be the personality test. <laughs> I'll be the one who decides. It's like the, uh, the Somali pirate. <laughs> I am the personality test. I am test the now. captain now. <laughs> <laughs> I am the personality <laughs> test now. I am Myers-Briggs. <laughs> so I've had patients who have told me – that, like, I, I, I've had them in the past where they're like, sometimes they get frustrated because I think the disc gets used in a lot of corporate spaces. And I've had some people that are like, I don't understand why my bosses don't read this thing. I've, I've got like a 20 page report from the disc that outlines who I am as a person and, and the kinds of strengths that I have and weaknesses and work environments that I would thrive in and work environments that I don't. And I don't understand why my boss doesn't have an exhaustive understanding of each one of their staff. And that's why I laugh at this crap in a corporate environment, because of course your boss isn't going to read this. At the end of the day, you're not measured on your personality. You're measured on whether you do the things you're supposed to do in a week. <laughs> right. That was it. <laughs> they don't care. Like, you know, oh, right. don't give this uh, assignment to Deborah. Why? Because Deborah's really more of a... a she's you know, a disc. Yeah. <laughs> she's a disc. <laughs> it's possible that I don't know how this works. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's pretty close <laughs> yeah yeah so <laughs> it's a disc <laughs> so yeah the, the, I don't think that they have a lot of reliability or value but I think Lindsay brings up a good question because yeah. I think she's saying okay at what point does this get a little creepy right at what point is this oh fun team building exercise but the disc is in a different category. The well, disc can be taken do, very seriously. You do have to worry about your employer making decisions off of this information. Yeah. Based right? on that's who a, you that's are. That's a valid concern. Right. I would be concerned about that, too. Right. If I'm an introvert but my job performance is excellent, promote I would, me. I would say <laughs> regardless of the personality test, whether it's the right. disc or, or the, the Myers-Briggs or any of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, that's some, that it uh, doesn't you're, matter. You're treading some dangerous water there, I think, I think it as is. an employer. So it's a good question. Um, so basically, when you read up on the disc, it seems to identify profiles. And so it has these patterns and it profiles. 
And so it says, uh, disc patterns and profiles. As you will appreciate, there are literally thousands of different combinations and scores. Therefore, to help interpretation, communication, and understanding, disc personality model experts, oh, geez, that bothers me right there, have defined through statistical analyses of the score combinations 15 disc patterns and profiles. Which is a fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Money well spent. And so they, they have a list of them here. Names often used are achiever, coach, evaluator, counselor, creator, individualist, inspirational, investigator, objective thinker, perfectionist, persuader, practitioner, enthusiast, results-oriented, or specialist. Okay, so that's interesting. So it has this breakdown. I think the free version that the three of us took, I didn't get a, a name. Did you guys get one? No, I didn't. Yeah. I got a pie chart. Yeah, I got a pie chart. I got a, a personality type. You did? Oh, you did? Yeah, I didn't. Scroll down. It says disc personality type. It says your disc personality. What? Oh, okay. If you look at the whole page. Oh, you just got to keep going down? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm too that? busy over here looking up definitions of fruit. <laughs> 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 These are the things that are relevant. Yours yeah, does you it too? just scroll down further. Right here, Maybe your disc personality type. All right. I'm, I'm still scanning my page to find it because I'm just finding the part where it wants money. When I scroll down... Yeah, that shows up in a couple different areas. Yeah, I just got like a little quote. Mine says, your disc personality type. Is that where you guys are talking about? Yep. But mine doesn't have a name. Well, mine doesn't have a name either. Okay, does yours have a name? No, Jacob's doesn't have a name. Yeah, you just get like this little horoscope blurb that says something about you. It's like a fortune cookie. Whatever. So, Lindsay, if you can't tell, we did not... Whatever our experience was with the disc, it was not selling. (laughs) This is not something that I think we came away with. Like, oh my God, it's so approachable. It really matters. Mine says, you are likely to be a good listener and something constructive advice rather than imposing your own ideas and values on others. Developing and maintaining relationships, work, and at play is important to you. That's your, your personality type? Yeah. Is where it says that? It says, you are an approachable and understanding person. Your optimism encourages you to look for the best in others. So there's no, I didn't get a title on that, though, <laughs> which is fine, but your, this frustrates your optimism? me. optimism? Yeah, I know. When have you had optimism? That's funny because in the thingy, I kept saying no. When it was like, you know, the, the statement's like, I identify as, as a person who always believes in the best. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, no, have you heard my anxiety? Go back there about therapy. I predicted global apocalypse like so many times. There's a shirt on his face. <laughs> There's a shirt Currently. on my face as I'm taking this. Like, how are, so no, I kept hitting no. Use so I the don't camera know. on the phone. Why Come on. This, you can just see it. So I don't know where that came from, but whatever. What does yours say, Nick? All right. You enjoy interacting with and helping people. You are open to new ideas and procedures. Although you are calm and controlled, you still project enthusiasm and optimism. Your natural supportive listening and empathetic behavior makes you a good coach, someone people turn to when they need help or advice. Okay. All right. That feels accurate. Do, do you like the, the the definitions on that? Sure. I mean, because that's what, those are the things I selected. Okay. So, yeah. yeah it's like, <laughs> that wasn't a surprise. Yeah. No, like, right. I, do you see, do you think that uh, other people see you as helpful? Yes. Yes. We you, predict that you, you are a helpful you're person. You're a helpful person. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. like you, gosh darn it. <laughs> Nailed it. Thank you, Tess. <laughs> what, what does your say, Jacob? Uh, you are socially oriented. You have a strong self-motivation to get to know people in all walks uh, of life. And to nurture those relationships, you have a natural enthusiasm for all types of ideas and projects, uh, your own and other people's. People are likely to describe you as gregarious, persuasive, and optimistic. I fundamentally always describe Jacob as gregarious. When people say, tell me about Jacob. Gregarious. I say, close your eyes. (laughs) Oh, you mean gregarious, Jacob? (laughs) We we call him Greggy for short. (laughs) We've just forgotten his own name at this point. All right, so I looked up the uh, the the DISC. By the so, way, I, I don't agree with that. Okay, yeah, d- that that no. doesn't the feel like the gregarious part. To you. Fine, but yeah. like uh, natural enthusiasm for all types of ideas and projects that is demonstrably false. <laughs> I have not said yes to this in a long I time. Have, I am against many other people's projects. <laughs> so the DISC: dominant, inspiring, supportive, and cautious. People who have outgoing and task oriented traits often exhibit dominant and direct behaviors. They usually focus on results, problem solving, and bottom line thinking. People who have both outgoing and people-oriented traits often exhibit inspiring and interactive behaviors. That's the I. They usually focus on interacting with people, having fun, and or creating excitement. 
People who have both reserved and people-oriented traits often exhibit supportive and steady, that's the S, behaviors. They usually focus preserving, uh, pr- preserving relationships and on creating and maintaining peace and harmony. And then the C, people who have both reserved and task-oriented traits often exhibit cautious and careful behaviors. They usually focus on facts, rules, and correctness. And so, Nick, I'm, I'm going to show this to you. There's a picture here where it kind of shows like a breakdown of the four corners of DISC. Yes. And you'll notice like the upper hemisphere says outgoing. So if you're a D or an I, in theory, you're a little bit more outgoing, okay? okay. Dominant or interactive. If you're on the bottom hemisphere, the C or the S, you're more reserved, okay? okay. And then if you're on the left hemisphere, the D and the C, uh, that's task-oriented. Okay. And then if you're on the right hemisphere, the I or the S, that's people-oriented. Okay. okay. So now that we've kind of played with this idea and discussed it, Nick, what are your thoughts on using a personality test in any corporate environment for whatever reason? Okay. So this is here's – a, here's a little uh, – <laughs> It's a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of irony, um, Lindsay, is that my sister contacted me Friday. She called me, and she told me about this uh, thing that they're doing – at her office. Okay. And it's a personality test. It's the Lumina Learning personality test. Huh. It's almost, it's very similar to what we just did. It's actually really similar. Remember that last one that we did that had the pie chart and the pieces of the pie were larger? Oh, yeah. The, uh, we did that well, on the, the show. What the hell was that thing? It was like, that was the sexy one that everybody was always talking about. Yes. We did it on the show. a therapist that asked about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't I can't remember which one it was. It's actually the very Enneagram. S- Yes, yes, that one, that one. Okay, so it's actually very, very similar to that one. Okay. Um, And so she asked me, she's like, because I remember you guys talking about this on the show. Like, what's your opinion on these things? Okay, personality tests in general. Yes. Okay. I said, well, here's my my, my thing on it. Most of them are are not based on anything empirical. Yeah. Right? There's no research that's going, that's that's showing that this is, uh, number one, accurate. Right. But then also usefulness right like i think we really get caught up in these personality tests in the same way that we get caught up in reading horoscopes yeah because it's entertaining yeah it's it's fun to do something like this and to try to learn something about ourselves yes right and it's always usually positive yeah right but just the same as a horoscope we we count the hits and we ignore the misses yeah right right so we only really acknowledge the things that we already know about ourselves or believe about ourselves. And then what useful is it? What use is it to an organization as a whole? That's the piece to me that I don't understand why a a corporation or a business would do this. Yeah. And my sister and I kind of went back and forth and she kind of said, well, some of the benefits of doing this and, um, yeah, I'll be honest. I wasn't really listening, but, uh, (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding, Carrie. I was listening. Um, but all of the things, Jessica, (laughs) <laughs> oh. you might be right yeah, I mean, um no but all of the things that she was talking about i think like okay yeah great that's useful to know i can achieve all of that knowledge without taking a personality test right i can know my employees by just getting to know them yes right by seeing their work outcome getting to you know talk to them learning about their personality that way i think we for the longest time we we were always trying to put people in boxes as ways to describe them. Yeah. Right. And the diagnosis, we talk about that occasionally too, like giving someone a diagnosis in the past, that has always been kind of a, an issue because it's like, Oh, you have this. So we're going to identify you in this, put you in this box. And we've worked really hard to get away from that. Right. And say, and understand that a diagnosis is just a way that we can categorize symptoms right. and that's it. But each individual person is their own thing. So if I'm working with someone with schizophrenia and I've got two, another person with schizophrenia, I'm not necessarily going to be treating them the same right? just because they have the same diagnosis. Yeah. Right. There's an individual perspective to this. Yeah. So we're trying to get out of putting people in boxes, but I feel like with the, the personality test industry is working on, let's put them back into boxes. Right. Let's, let's find ways that we can characterize this group of people. So in the colors training, you know, like, oh, okay, Jim's, yeah. Jim's an orange. I've had that one. So, so this, these are the things that we know about Jim. Yeah. Jim does this, this, and this, and this. I know that because he's an orange. Right. Right. Well, okay. How about we just get to know Jim? Right. And then we'll figure out, you know, how to approach Jim that way. Yeah. Right. I'm going to take the opposite view on this one. Ironically, because I hate personality tests. Yeah. As a rule, I just think they're dumb. 
So like, I mean, I don't know. Like, there, I think you said it well when you said it's entertaining. Yeah, I think it's entertaining. But what I kind of also appreciate, though, and by the way, if anybody out there, I, I, if if any listener is an IO psychologist, industrial and organizational psych, or if you know somebody who's an industrial and organizational psychologist. I would love if you would put us in touch with them. Yes. That would be a great guess. Yes. I would love to hear about their discipline. I will not mock them. I, it's a legitimate discipline. I have no problem with that. I actually thought about IO psych. I think as you'd, a you'd be a really good IO psych. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, it's a, it's a really interesting idea. Yeah. For those who don't know, it's applying psychology into business organizational work to try to maximize efficiency, happiness, human resources, achieve big goals. Because at the end of the day, a company's human capital is its greatest resource. You right. know, like if you're Intel, but people matter. Like they build your stuff. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the ground level. So to that extent, I kind of do like the disc. You know, I think if you have a big company, if you're like Intel or you're UPS or something big, and you're thinking, okay, I want to be intentional with these humans. I don't want the fluke of what who hired them and what department they're in to decide who they work with primarily. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I would I use it for, as a sorting this. hat. You yes. know, like like Hogwarts. Like, all right, let's put the Gryffindor together. Why? Because they'll get along, they'll succeed, they'll play well, their group projects will be, you know, whatever. Like, they'll, okay. they'll just do well. Let's put Slytherin together. Why? It's not to segregate these humans. They're going to interact, right? But I don't mind having that advanced knowledge when I'm assembling teams. I'll tell you what okay. I really like about it. The human body is oddly shaped. Like, if you look at things in nature, the human body is just oddly shaped. So if you put people in boxes, yeah. they stack easier. Yes. You That's know what? true. It's just efficient. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know what? And that's let's not, flat surface. Yeah, that's what you cube. need. You need let's, cubicle no, no, humanity. No no, 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 no. You're on the right track, but no. Hexagons. Oh, okay. okay. That's the most efficient use of space because yeah. otherwise if it's a cube, then you've got corners that aren't being you know utilized. This is the yeah. first time that I've truly believed that Nick has an advanced degree. Uh, yeah, this is it. <laughs> Here it is. Also, we don't talk enough about the brute force of the hexagon, okay? Right. Yeah, when it comes to structure, the hexagon is second to none. You Surprisingly, know? Yes. the hexagon, also a fruit. <laughs> Fact. Hold on. <laughs> We're, you know what? Let's let's double or nothing. I feel like this is my comeback. Is is a hexagon a fruit? Oh, I hope it says yes. It'd be, it'd be great. It says uh, hexagon fruit. Apparently, it's available on Etsy. So <laughs> so yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big yes. So yeah, Lindsay, like, I don't know. I, I don't think you need to be scared that a corporation is going to somehow put so much priority on this that it's going to negatively affect you. But in the hands of a bad boss, anything that's is That's what I was going to say. That's yes. what I was going to say is, is if they, if, if an boss? organization uses this to exploit employees, they're already an evil which, I mean, aren't they, though? Because, like, part of this thing is, like, oh, this person is task-oriented. This person's people-oriented. Okay, so what are you going to do? Give the tasks to the task person. No, no, no. no. So I, they have more work to do? Here's the thing that I think you were... The other humans get to be the party planning the, committee? The, the area that I think you were going in the right direction was Until large... Until spiraled off the road. <laughs> <laughs> Until we got to the fruit-vegetable thing. <laughs> the, the, uh, the large corporations okay huge organizations right so right. yeah so if you're at google and yeah. you have everybody do this and you kind of understand a little bit more about the personalities of the people who work for you yeah and you can tailor a work environment that's going to best accommodate those individuals right like that to me makes more sense i think it does but then again it it really goes back to how much faith or how much trust are you going to put into this because you could yeah. do the same thing with horoscopes too right like oh geez right. we've got way more areas that work in this organization right. than maybe we should do this and isn't that interesting though i think that this desire to put humans not in the boxes that uh jacob was talking about but in in in, in categories hexagons, don't know yeah, why. hexagons uh, right. yeah nick was talking about that <laughs> the the desire to do that goes all the way back to horoscopes you know it goes back to the year uh, you were born and like personality traits that we read into you so I don't know. I think if you're a big, huge company and, and like you look up my name and I'm in Google and my supervisor pulls up my profile to have a meeting with me and it says, hey, FYI, these are Jim's scores on the disc. This kind of personality type tends to uh, work well this way and they tend to respond well to this. Great. I'm glad I did that. You know, and I, hopefully the supervisors are trained to use that information in a way that improves flow and function. I would argue that that's the only value this test can possibly bring. Yeah. However, 
the human species has a terrible history of doing this where once we can categorize people, we accidentally discriminate against them for whatever reason. So you're like, oh, these guys are the, you know, the right. INFJs or these guys are the blues or whatever. We're the greens, you know. And, like, there's been so many studies in life that have shown this, that even with kindergartners, they've done this test where, like, they give them, like, a sticker. <laughs> and, like, half the class gets stickers and, like, they abuse each other. <laughs> like, as soon as there's an in-grouping and out-grouping of humans, they don't work well anymore. Like, they right. start to distinguish each other. Yeah. It's not good. So any company that gets into that, you know, I think it could be dangerous, too. Right. I'll never forget when I came back to the office after doing the colors training. Oh, yeah. And my boss asked me, you know, what'd you think of it? You know, I, was, I, I said I was a green. You know, what would what, you think of it? And I was like, oh, I thought it was bullshit. You know, whatever. <laughs> Typical I green. It, I explained, it's exactly what she said. That is exactly what she said. I was so angry. Such a green thing to say. Yes. And then she starts making up all these weird, like, <laughs> epithets and stuff. Yeah, whatever, Kermit. What? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you get back to your desk? Easy being green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I'm, I'm sorry. What did you just say to me? Back to your desk, Mountain Dew. Okay, I'll call you when I need you, you leprechaun. What? <laughs> just, I just yeah. feel like that's our word. You shouldn't say that. Anyway, Lindsay, opt out. <laughs> opt out if you can. I mean, you can do it for fun. You're, do it for I think fun. you're safe. I, I if mean, they're paying for it, do it. It's expensive. You know, yeah. we don't want to put fifteen bucks. Fifteen dollars. Yeah, that's for the crappy online one. Some <laughs> yeah. corporation sold this to that company. Oh, oh yeah. And yeah. and that's where I think if 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 I if, okay, Lindsay, here's my answer. Is this thing bullshit? Yes. If it's me who's calling your company and offering to do this test with all the people for tens of thousands of dollars. Please sign up. Sign up. Yeah, I feel like yeah, <laughs> then it's legit and then everything I'm offering to sell you is true. And these psychometric tests are valuable. <laughs> So it depends on who it is, Lindsay. So if it's me, say yes. Psychometric tests aren't BS. Yeah. The ones that Jim doesn't do are BS. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's fine. But right. they don't know the difference, Nick. So if <laughs> I just come in and say, you know, psychometric tests have a lot of value. Anyway, here's the disc. <laughs> right. If I just put it in that order, they're going to write the check, man. They're going to write the check. They're going to look up psychometric tests. They're going to realize it's yep. a vegetable. And then they're not going to realize be, I'm selling them a fruit. Could there be usefulness in it? Yes. I think so. I think there's value. I mean, but... It's but, not a blood test, Lindsay. Right. You know, like, it's whatever. It's this fluid, weird thing. But in the hands of humans, all things are weapons. So do we care? Are we going to say what the what the pie chart is for no. us? What is... You got a pie chart? Yeah, you did too. Oh, should I close that window? What's... <laughs> Jesus. What's your pie chart? It's above where it says uh, personality type. I closed the window. How did you not see that first? Is that what that... The okay. huge, colorful there's pie colors. chart. There's colors. Okay. Yeah, I, I left that. So, oh, okay. okay, so what were I, yours? Uh, my biggest was A, which is steadiness. Ah. 36%. Uh, I'll just tell you right steady. now, the uh, A is just because that's your biggest. It changes based on who, uh, oh. on what it is. So, like, oh. on mine, A, uh, st- steadiness is not A. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All right. It's like okay. a ranking. What, what oh. was yours, Jacob? Uh, mine is influence. Okay. With 42%. Ah, mm-hmm. what he was your steadiness there? I, you know what? I uh, think of Jacob is forty-two percent influential. That's yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the right amount. Of see, influence. I'm still not clear. We talked about this off air. No, clue. I'm still not clear what influence means. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Yeah. In what ways do I influence? Yeah, because I got influences B for me. That was my second highest. That but 34. is it I influence people or people influence me? You know what? Yes. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're discussing change versus acceptance. You're listening to Pod Therapy. I've been influenced to play this ad music. <laughs> See? 42%. <laughs> this week's Therapy Producer sponsor is Robert Brownie Jr. Mint. Woo! This week's trivia theme is Ocean Animal Facts. Okay. An electric eel. The ocean. The sea. Yes, all right. <laughs> Rhode Island. <laughs> An electric eel is known to produce electricity sufficient enough to light how many electric light bulbs? Are these LEDs? Uh, I, the website not. did not. Because it's all of them if it's LEDs. Uh, if you would like to join Robert Brown and Junior Mints and make the show possible, go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. you got to figure it's enough electricity to zap a guppy, right? Because this, thing, this thing's got to eat. So how many light bulbs does it take to zap a guppy? I think it's time for us to do a little experiment. You gentlemen ready? I just happened to have a guppy Let's right here. Let's run down to Home Depot and PetSmart. They're in the <laughs> same parking lot. <laughs> Knock this thing out. All right, I'm going to guess zero. Oh, it could okay. power zero lights. Okay. I will go with the over and take 10. 
Nailed it. Ten. Yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't give me enough credit for my aquatic engineering knowledge. but For, it's for your guessing ability. Yeah. My guessing, <laughs> well, some call it guessing, some call it premonition. Some you know? call it guessing. Those people are correct. <laughs> <laughs> change versus acceptance. To change or not to change. It's known that we can always improve ourselves, but when does the goal to improve oneself get overridden by the distress caused by the pursuit? In particular, if there's an attribute of myself that I'd like to change or improve on, attribute, that one, social skills, anger management, etc., how much should I try to improve before settling in and accepting these attributes as who I truly am? I feel like these are two conflicting thought processes and would like to see the middle ground. Thanks, Anonymous. Wow. That's a good question. That is a really good question. So you've you've probably had people that you've met in your career that are obsessed with self-help. You ever ever bumped into that kind of person? Uh, Yeah, a little bit. So the kind of person I'm describing is like, it seems like every time I talk to that kind of a person... They are pursuing epiphany. Oh, they've got something they're working on. Yeah, it's the newest thing. You know, like, okay. oh my gosh, you know, this one's game changer. You know, it's always this game changer epiphany. I never yeah, realized Tony Robbins' myself. new book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, the, the perpetual Tony Robbins seekers, you know, those guys. And, and like, they're always in the pursuit of change, you know, and they have all this language and lingo. You know, they, it's the secret. They're going to manifest or, or they're going to level up. Oh, God, I hear that one all the time. You know, they're, they're going to, like, all these things that are this pursuit of ad- adaptations. And, there's a good question in that. I don't think the writer's saying that, but it, it draws that answer out of me because I think it is a good question because there have been times where I've kind of coached somebody that they come to me and say, so, Jim, the goals I want to work on is to change, 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 change. And at some point, I have been a voice to say, you're actually fine just the way you are. Yeah. They'll be like, no, 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 I still procrastinate on projects. I'll be like, that's, yeah. that's so a mental technique to approach challenges. So what? It's not bad. And they're like, no, no, no procrastination's bad. And I'm like, no, corporate America told you that, but the truth is, it's it's a it's an approach. Whatever, you get do you get things done? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, do you, do you, there's a balance. I mean, it is. Yeah, and and then where do you find that balance? Like the the listener is asking. Yeah, you know, at what point do I accept these traits about myself versus at what point should I continue to try to work to change them? <laughs> I mean, what? What that, metric? That, yeah. Clinically like, significant you, amount of distress, I guess. I think, yeah. I mean, that's probably where we would go with it as yeah. therapists is we would say, well, is it causing you problems? If the cure is worse than the problem, then stop. <laughs> like, I'd rather you live with that. So, like, let's take a uh, something. Let's let's use an example. So, let's say um, patients. Okay. Yeah. So, let's just talk about that's I'm I'm your client, Jim. I'm your patient. <laughs> and I'm working on patience. Yeah, you have uh, seeds inside. A, <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm a fruit. Oh my god. <laughs> Women are fruit. Okay. <laughs> Did you get it? It's there. It's all there. Wow. Pot therapy does not believe women are fruit. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> Oh, you guys make all these standards, and then you just walk <laughs> away when I take them to their logical end. That's fine. Right. That's fine. So if I'm your patient, yes, and I've identified that patience is something I need to work on, yes. at what point do you say, all right, maybe you don't need to work on patience. Maybe you just need to accept that you're an impatient that person. you have some impatient tendencies. Right. Impatient characteristics. Yeah. And let's try to model your life around accommodating those instead of trying to change them. Yeah, gosh. From jump. From jump, I'm probably going to say that. So you would err on the side of adjusting your lifestyle to accommodate your personality, or not necessarily personality, but your traits, as opposed to trying to work on traits and changing traits. To be clear, writer, and and to answer Nick's question, I think that... There are problems that sometimes do need to be solved that are objectively a problem. The way that Nick happens to be framing it, which is congruent with the way you gave examples in your letter, honestly, tempts me to see this more as a personality reality than it is a problem. I want my patient to feel authentically congruent. That's what's important to me. Oh, okay. And that also comes out of my personal way of doing therapy and my heroes. You know, I look at Carl Rogers. I look at Milton Erickson. So what? explain to the listener what you mean. So Carl Rogers and oh, authentic congruence. Yeah, I I, I don't want I, I'm good with you changing. Right. If you're my patient, I want you to change. And along the way, I also want you to be congruent with who you authentically are. What does that mean? Are you impatient or Nick? Are you decisive? 
Maybe that's it. Maybe there's two mm-hmm. sides of the same coin here. Maybe the coin quality we're talking about is that you cannot long endure the loading screen of the video game, <laughs> but you're also the decisive enough guy that, you know, you will write a book or you will enter a contest or you will go on some adventure and say yes to things. You don't need to think 35 thoughts. You can just pick between three options. Some people wish they could be that decisive, and you quite are. Isn't that an advantage? Isn't that type of person also by necessity sort of impatient? Yeah, mm-hmm. they kind of are. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's move toward acceptance of that and working with that, which now curtails into a, a technique that Nick and I use called solution-focused brief therapy. I'm not so much staring at what you don't have. I'm staring at what you do have. Oh, you're not impatient. You're decisive. Okay, how do decisive people solve problems? How do decisive people take on this essay with your coursework that you feel like you've waited until the last minute to do? When are you going to be decisive about taking action and what are you going to do? So what are we doing? We're, we're, we're modeling progress, right? Mm-hmm. And we're trying to keep them congruent so they don't self-hate. But this is still, I think, I'm not invalidating the writer's letter because I think that there's a variation of this, which is like, he, he says, social skills, uh, anger management. So if I have an anger management problem, at what point do I accept that I, I'm a hothead, right? My emotions boil close to the surface. At what point, me trying to fix this, is it unfixable? And that's a hard question, Nick, because I don't know that either of us really believe something's unfixable. Right. And then uh, that's that's always been my issue, too, with people talking about, like you mentioned, your true, authentic self. Right. And how you see yourself. Right. right? Because then I've seen that go to an unhealthy place, too. Right, right. Where people will say, well, this is just my authentic me. Oh, yeah. I need to be true to myself. Oh, yeah. Because then what happens is then you get to a point where you're saying, I'm not even going to attempt to work on these things right. because I don't see that I can make changes. Right. Sometimes that true authentic self can be used as an excuse to not have to deal with things. Exactly. Which I think is, is a good point to bring up professionalism. Like the slippery slope of, of this is that you could use this thinking to do nothing. Yeah. Or you could use this thinking to hate yourself into oblivion. Right. And feel that you're never good enough. You know, and constantly do the emotional, psychological equivalent of plastic surgery on yourself until there's nothing left. You know, so like there's a slippery slope on both sides of the peak. Yeah. The professional is the scalpel. The professional knows how to wield the scalpel between harm and health and knows how to get you to success. Right. So I, I would defer to them, you know, to the professional to help weave that through. But it's a good question, writer. You know, whenever we think about at some point the pursuit of change, can it become a problem in and of itself? Yes. Anything taken to excess could. And is there going to be qualities that perhaps we're going to have to accept a percentage of? Yes. Acceptance with adaptation. Anger management, for example. Right. Do you accept this is part of who you are? This is is a conversation I've had with people. Jim, I'm still an angry person. Okay. um, But did you uh, punch another hole in your wall? No, but Jim, obviously the problem's still here. I'm still an angry person. And, and I have to step toward them and say, I'm so proud of you for not punching a hole in your wall. How did you manage to do that? And then they just punch him. <laughs> and they go, Jim, fix me. Like, you know, why are you not fixing me? And I'm like, but, but we are, right? I'm judging you based on your behaviors. You're accepting that you, your blood boils close to the surface. Okay, how are we adapting to modify your life so that we understand that? That's what congruent authenticity is. With change. So, yeah, writer. I think that hopefully we're ruminating on this enough to add a lot of color to the page. And Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very nuanced debate. Yeah, it's hard to answer. Yeah, I, I think we can add some nuance, some clarification right. to it, but it's hard to really come down to it and answer it. But, you know, I, I guess for me, I, I always just kind of look at uh, understanding that progress is going to take a long time. Right. People don't change easily. All right. Change is a slow-moving process. So I think that's sometimes what happens, too, is we we anticipate that, you know, I've been in therapy for six months now, and I'm still angry. Right. Therapy is not working. I just need to be angry, and just everybody needs to accept that this is who I am. Right. Well, no, not necessarily. We are making progress. It's just we're we're trying to change a human being. Right. It's going to take a long time, and change is a lot of work. Right. You know, I think if we... If we can enter into it with that perspective and understand that it's going to take a long time. Yes. And it's going to be slow moving. And it's and and there's no deadline. Right. Like we don't have to change before, you know, January of next year. There's no deadline. Right. It's we're just going to take one step at a time. And then we'll just see where we go. Yeah, I agree with that. And, And to the writer, the two examples you said, anger management, social skills, like that's another one. 
Social skills is a good question. Okay, I have social anxiety. Hi, I'm here to see a therapist. I have social anxiety. This is causing problems in my life. Great, let's start working on that. We start working on that. At some point, can we accept that this is kind of just who I am? Is that wrong? Is it bad to be an introvert? Is it bad to sort of just not prefer the company of others? Is it bad? Am I bad for this? Well, no. Can we accept that this is just who I am? Do we have to try to change this? No, maybe we do, you know, reach a place where we Mm -hmm. want to accept that. I think as a therapist, I'm making that decision about where I want to go with the treatment planning once I'm not seeing cognitive distortions. Once I'm not seeing the person do these dysfunctional stuff, like if I'm not seeing dysfunctional thought patterns, if I'm not, like if they're like catastrophizing, I don't want to go out with friends. Why? I'm scared I'm going to pee my pants in the horror movie and I'm going to be humiliated forever and I've been ruminating on that for 15 minutes now and I'm having a panic attack. Yep, I don't want you to accept that. That's right. not where I want you to land. That's so, not a final spot for you. Again, kind of going back to if we were using a solution-focused brief therapy approach, and we right. applied the miracle question, right? right? So the miracle question essentially is if a miracle occurred and this problem was gone, right? but let's say the miracle occurred while you were sleeping so you didn't know it happened, when you woke up the next day, what would be different that would tell you? that a miracle has occurred. Would you so if you no longer all of a sudden have this social anxiety, what would be the thing that you would notice right. that would tell you something is different? Yeah. So the way that that question is worded, it's really meant to focus on observable yes. behaviors, things like that. So maybe the right. person would be able to answer that and say, you know, I I would I would be I'd feel comfortable going to a movie with my friends. And I wouldn't be right. scared or talking myself out of yeah. it. I wouldn't be canceling so, plans. I just go. And then even when I'd they look were forward to it, if, if they were doing that, yes. Now, this, the last thing you said is more important than the, the other things, because you started listing things that you wouldn't be doing. Which, right. as a as a solution focused brief therapist, I don't care about. Right. I'm ignoring all of that. I'm only listening for what are the things that behaviors. you will be doing. Right. right. So, really, what you're doing at that point is you're describing what your goal is. Yes. So now it's no longer about changing who you are or changing personality traits. We're now goal oriented. Yes. My goal is I want to be able to go to a movie with my friends. Right. All right. So now we can work specifically on building the skill set needed to achieve that goal. goal. And then it's, we are no longer having this debate. Right. About whether or not I need to change who I am. Right. Or whether I accept who I am. We're talking about specific behaviors that I can go now do. Yes. I can live my life. I can do these things. There, there was a, I don't know if this is true or not, but some story about, okay, who, who chiseled the statue David? Was that Michelangelo? Michelangelo. Michelangelo. The, the, okay, so he was the orange turtle. So Right, uh, yeah. correct. All right, so when Michelangelo was, was creating David, the sculpture David, uh, allegedly, somebody asked him, you know, how did you, did you carve David? How did you create David? And he said, I didn't create David. I took a David was always in there. He was always in the solid block of rock. I chipped away everything that wasn't David. And what was left was was him. And and so he was I like that metaphor because yeah. I think it applies here. When what do we want to change in the human? I want to take away everything that's dysfunctional. I want to take away all the stuff that's problematic, the dysfunctional thought patterns, the cognitive distortions, the self-sabotaging behavior, um, catastrophizing, all the maladaptations, trauma stuff. I want to remove all that, and whatever's left, left, that's authentically you. Right. That's your authentic David. That's your congruent self. Let's accept whatever's left, but let's clean it up first, right? I want to get that part done. And, and that writer, I think, is the essence of this debate of, you know, where do we accept and where do we change? We change everything that's changeable, and whatever's left, we accept. Yep. We carve you into David. Cowabunga, as, as the great Michelangelo was known to say. Yes. Fact. Fact. Also, he was a vegetable. Thanks for writing a fruit. That was a good question. Women are fruit. Thank you for the question. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to discuss life coaching versus therapy. Interesting. It's better. <laughs> You're listening Discussion to Pod Therapy. Over. <laughs> this week's Therapy Producer sponsor is Kayla Lansbury. The second trivia question in honor of Kayla is What ocean life form has been around for more than 650 million years, outdating both dinosaurs and sharks? I got you. Wait a minute. Outdating sharks? Yes. Damn it. If you would like to join Kayla Lansbury and make the show possible, you can go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. Is it a type of shark? No. Okay. Is it going to be, it's not going to be something simple like algae. It's going to be something like, that's interesting, like an animal, right? Not like is it a, a vertebra- single cell Is it a thing. vertebrate? 
It is not a vertebrae. Okay. Good question. That was solid. This is a good 20 questions game we got going on right now. All right, so it's not a vertebrate, ancient sea life. Is it an animal? Uh, yes. Okay, so that rules out things like algae, plank- plankton. It is not plankton. Hmm. He's always trying to steal the secret recipe to the crusty crab. So I would imagine it's not him. You guys okay. watch SpongeBob. All right. <laughs> is it a sponge? It is not a sponge. Is it a stingray? It is not a stingray. Is it a crab? It's but not it a is, vertebrate. But it is very simple. Wait, did he say it's not a vertebrate? It's it is not a, a it vertebrate. It is an invertebrate. It's a mollusk of some kind. Uh, an eel. No. That's uh, a vertebrate. Shit. Yeah, they just have a really bendy back. And a they? fruit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a vegetable. We're talking, well, unless it's a girl eel, then they are vegetable or fruit. Uh, so it's not a crab. Is it a horseshoe crab? It is not. <sighs> Any guesses? It's an I'll, invertebrate. I'll guess so. No. Invertebrate. No. no, I don't want you to tell me. I want to get it. It's an invertebrate, ancient sea life. It outdates sharks. It's still around. Yes, still around. It's not a crab. It's, Lobsters. It's, it's also not peanut butter. Peanut butter. Peanut? Are you giving us a hint? A jellyfish. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just angry uh, and hurt. Nailed it. I think I'm just sad. That's fine. I'm sad for all of us. Life coaching. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> the lights are flickering. The lights are flickering. The question is, hey, hey, Jim mentioned recently that he does life coaching. And I was wondering if he'd talk more about that. What is the difference? I've not heard a therapist say that they also life coach. What is the line between that and therapy? Shame. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> that allows you to practice <laughs> over state lines. Thanks, Lori. Three scoops a lady. Haven't heard from Lori in a while. Okay, so good question. Um, and yeah, I guess it, all these years we've never really talked about it. So to call oneself a therapist is a regulated word. You can't just walk around doing that. It's practicing without a license, which is a crime. And there's usually some kind of censorship if you do that. So if you're a therapist, you're subscribing to a medical model of the problem, okay? That doesn't mean that we only treat medical problems, right? If somebody comes in with anxiety, yep, therapist is the right door that you should walk through, right? But sometimes people walk in and say, I'm not living my best life. uh, I want to get a promotion at work, and I'm here to talk with a therapist about that. De facto, we're, we're assuming a different mental posture when we're helping that kind of a person. And we would colloquially call that coaching or consulting. Different, different groups call it different things. Because the phrase life coaching is well known at this point, actually many therapists are, are comfortable saying, yeah, I also do life coaching. And if you ask us what is the difference, we'll say it's non-medical, non-clinical. Right. So like I'm not treating your anxiety specifically. Um, I'm not performing my duties as a therapist. So my duties, my, my service delivered to you, it might cost the same thing because an hour of my time costs the same amount of money. But I'm not going to write you up a super bill. You can't bill insurance for this. Um, I'm not performing as a healthcare provider. I am performing as any person could. Even the uh, audio guy of a podcast could. Um, but I'm bringing to bear my life experience in the same way that that person would bring to bear their life experience. Is that pretty much sum up what life coaching is to So you? let me ask if kind of the follow-up that I think she's kind of getting at is if, uh, if I went to you for therapy and Jacob goes to you for life coaching, how is our experience with you going to be different? Well, I think it would be the same. The thing you're asking for, so let's say you come to both of us and you say, the problem I'm having is um, I just have a lot of stress in my life and I feel like I'm, I'm stuck. And I just want to, you know, challenge myself and do some growth. Okay, cool. Like, we can both try to do that. The, the bag of tricks that we each have is going to be very different based on our lived experiences and everything that we bring to bear. So when you go to a therapist for life coaching, the, the weird blurry line is we both know what you're getting. You're getting a therapist, right? They've trained for that. They have a bag of tricks that come from therapy, okay? But you're, you're accessing them as a life coach. There's value to that because I can talk to somebody in Germany. I could talk to somebody in Florida. I could talk to somebody in Maine. Anybody has the right to go to my website and hire me and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm booking an hour with you, and um, I live in another state. Is that a problem? 
No, as long as we go through the talk, you know, and I have an informed consent that specifically spells out the duties and, and job that I will do, the services that I offer. If you're, if you're hiring me as a therapist, there is a very specific ethical code that I cite. There's a very specific list of things that go into the definition of what that is. If you're out of state, de facto, I will tell you, I am not your therapist. But if you're looking for a life coach, and if I'm a person that you look to as valuable, I'm happy to work with you. So if you're working with me, and we're doing life coaching, yeah. and I'm your client, is there a point where maybe we get into something where you say, okay, uh, life coaching is no longer appropriate for you, you need therapy? Yes, yes. So if let's say you're talking to somebody who is in another state. Let's pick a random one. Let's say Rhode Island, since I've shit on them so much. So Rhode Island person calls and says, you know, Jim, um, let, let's just make this as real as we possibly can. I've heard the podcast. Um, I like you as a person. I'd like to work with you, man. Um, I realize you can't be my therapist because I don't live in Nevada and you practice in Nevada. Um, but I'd like, honestly, for you to be whatever the hell a life coach is to me and just be this person toward me. That's fine. Okay, but we'll go through the problems. We're going to identify them. If I realize, hey, this person is, you know, in danger, right? Like addiction danger, suicidal danger. Um, they need somebody on the ground. I will refer out at that point, and I will also facilitate for them, and I will triage that problem and say, okay, I really want you to have a therapist in your area. I want somebody for safety reasons. Here's the things I'm going to recommend you work on. But I still work for you, so I'm actually going to help. Like I'm going to help find that therapist and get you connected, and, and probably call and, and warm hand off you or whatever we need to do. So there's a lot of differences to that, but yes, I think that you would triage that patient, and at some point, you need to recognize they need a medical professional on the ground. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of this, too, would have to do with diagnosis. If correct. you have somebody that has, if, if you're able to do a diagnosis of a mental health condition, then therapy would probably be more relevant than life coaching. If you have somebody that wouldn't meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis, but just needs some added Support, guidance, support, assistance, whatever. Um, you don't have a diagnosis, a condition that you're specifically treating. Therefore, correct. Life coach, but also keep in mind, I don't have to render a diagnosis. So I could meet with any human and probably see in some of their their features they have a diagnosis of right. anxiety. So but as that a might not be what I'm treating. Right, right. Yeah. So as a therapist, though, you may be. I mean. Because if you're doing private pay, you really don't have to have a diagnosis anyway because right. no one needs it. I don't need right? one. So you could – but the person may still have a diagnosis even right. though they don't actually Exactly. Exactly. So like I actually – while we were talking, I just pulled up my actual informed consent. So here's what we're talking about. Whenever a person books with me, um, they'll get uh, this email that says, hey, if you're a new person, please click this link and read this thing and write your name on it. And that, that document's called an informed consent. It teaches you all about what I do. Here's a section called Definition of Services, and I'll, I'll kind of read this out. And again, I'm not the only therapist doing this. It's actually extremely common. If you go to Psychology Today, you'll see other therapists. They'll say, yep, I also do life coaching. It's something that we'll say because it becomes this catch-all of, I want to talk to you, the human I see here, who has the resume I'm seeing. I want to talk to you, but do I, you know, do I have to fit in a box in order to do that? And the answer is no. We'll also say, yeah, I'm just life coach, whatever. You know, we can just talk and work on your goals if that's what you want to do. So in my definition of services, I have uh, in my informed consent this. Clinical professional counseling uses a biopsychosocial model to diagnose and treat dysfunction in behaviors and mental health. This counseling type adheres to the American Counseling Association Code of Ethics to ensure best practices and is regulated by the Nevada Board of Marriage and Family Therapists and Clinical Professional Counselors. Speaking of which, I also distinguish that, by the way, from my other license as a clinical uh, alcohol and drug counselor. So I have another definition of service that says clinical alcohol and drug counseling uses a biopsychosocial model to diagnose and treat dysfunctions surrounding substance use disorders and co-occurring mental health disorders. This counseling adheres to the National Association of Alcohol and Drug Counselors Code of Ethics and ensures best practices and is regulated by the Nevada Board of Alcohol, Drug Counseling, and Gambling. So I'm defining what each posture is, right? right. And then the third thing I write is life coaching uses a blend of wisdom, pragmatism, and experience to better an individual's life. This counseling does not attempt to, to diagnose or treat mental health issues. Coaching is a form of mentorship and guidance, which is designed to improve a client's life and unlock their potential. This counseling is unregulated in the state of Nevada. So there it is. So, you know, that's what you're essentially bookmarking for the person. Right. Do you think you're... You... Not knowing that a tomato is a fruit hurt your claim to wisdom. Uh, we we all agree that wisdom is knowing when to use the tomato. 
Not knowing what it is. Correct. Okay, you said that. That, that is a knowledge you said claim knowledge. and not a wisdom claim. Yeah, I don't so claim life right. coaching has you're any right. knowledge to it. You're it's claiming wisdom. wisdom. To know gotcha. when you slice a tomato and put it in. Gotcha. But yeah, I had a person reach out to me a couple of weeks ago. I think I brought it up on the show. Where they said, Jim, I went to your website. It says you do life coaching, but you don't have a jingle? So... So do you really? <laughs> so do you? <laughs> Poser. <laughs> yeah, where are you going with this? And I was like, that's solid. <laughs> like, I don't have a light show either, which is currently uh, happening, by the way. there's the, the strobe lights are going on, so I don't know. So that that's the difference, uh, everybody, life coaching versus therapy. So it's very common um, that, you know, you could hire a CPA to be your life coach, and you would select that person as a life coach because of their background, right? That would appeal to you. In the same way that you could hire a professional golfer um, to coach you at golf, or you could tell them to come teach you how to be a bartender, you know, whatever. But if you don't feel like their experience is very relevant, you won't ask them for certain things. So to hire a therapist as a life coach, obviously you're selecting that person to do this life coaching because of their background. But that doesn't mean they're going to diagnose mental illness or treat it, because at that point they'll say, hey, this is getting a little too into the weeds. Um, Maybe we need to think about your safety or whatever. Mm -hmm. Ethically, would it be okay to transfer someone over from your life coaching practice to your therapy practice? We call it self referring. Assuming, assuming that they are you know, in, if like, they're in the state, in state yes. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's fine. That's why all of my definitions of service are part of the same informed consent. Okay. In the same way that, let's say Nick's my patient, and uh, Nick hires me, and he comes in. And the first session, I'm like, why are we here, Nick? And he's like, I have anxiety. And I'm like, okay, cool. So mentally, I'm, I'm thinking, let's attack this from anxiety. Six months in, uh, I start to see signs of alcoholism in Nick. And, he, and I do a quick ASAM, which is the six dimensions that is in an earlier Patreon episode. And I look at that, and I register a diagnosis, and I say, yep, my man uh, definitely has substance use disorder, and uh, he needs outpatient level one of care. I don't have to, like, unless I'm talking to an insurance, I don't have to do any special magic trick to suddenly shift my skill box to help Nick. Okay. I'm, I am those things. I am qualified. So my spectrum of care ranges from, you know, mental health to substance abuse to life coaching. I can follow the case wherever it goes, and I don't have to put them in a box or a new file or write something special. That's why during the informed consent, I just say, here's all the things that I am. Here's all the services that I can provide. And here's when I will use them. There you go. But if you're out of state, by definition, I cannot be your medical therapist because it is a regulated discipline in the state of Nevada. I will perform as your life coach, and I will do that until I ethically can't do that. And then at that point, we will uh, protect you and make sure that you're facilitated into better care. At what point will you get a jingle? (sighs) You know, only Froyo can decide. (laughs) He is the great arbiter. To decide who is a life coach and who is not. When Justin gets you a jingle, then you're a life You've coach. You've made it. Yeah. That's when you, that's official. That, since there's no board uh, I think that to recognize it, it yeah. I think that's the closest that's, thing that's we have the, yeah. to the board of life coaching Yep, is uh, Froyo's jingles. Yep. So. so the unspoken question before I move on from that, if you're out there and you've been in different states, some some of you guys have written in before and said, in my particular state, it's very difficult to find a good therapist or something like that. Um, and, and maybe you're nearby another state and you're like, dang it, like I wish I could you know, search across the border. Like if you live in like Reno, you're like 20 minutes away from California or something like that. Like you, it, that's a good question. Like can you really not select somebody who's across the state border or whatever? Yeah, sometimes you can because if they'll if they'll identify as a life coach and if you're not using insurance, then okay, you could probably start working with that person and trust their professional judgment if, about their own comfort level with whatever they're working on with you. And there's a wide range of stuff that we could be working on that's subclinical. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it has to reach a pretty good threshold before it's like, boy, I shouldn't be helping this person. Like I deliver my services via telehealth. I have a patient right now that's in Germany. It feels no different than a patient who's in Henderson. I'm literally talking to them through Zoom. Right. Right. If I feel they need a safety plan, we safety plan. But I'm going to provide that continuity of care because I'd rather she have access to care than have to learn German to, like, talk to somebody in Germany. Right. So we figure that out on a case-by-case basis. So anyway, it's more options on the table if that's something you were looking into. Also, you can go to lifecoachjacob.com. He's available. (laughs) The lights have started flickering in here again. Uh, 
the, the greatest feature for a podcast, I'll, I'll, I'll point out. Yes. All right. <laughs> uh, in the last episode of the show, uh, we announced that our Thera producers have expanded uh, from the Elite 8 to the Saccharin 16. And uh, in this episode, we're actually taping this the exact same day as we did that episode. So if anybody did go to uh, patreon.com slash therapy and join at the Thera producer level to try to fill in those spots up to 16, um, we want to thank you. We want to shout your name from the rooftops. We can't because we don't know that you did that because that is in the future. But we do want to thank, uh, because it's the first episode of the month, we want to thank all of our Therapods, Therodactyls, and uh, Theraproducers that already exist. Again, if you would like to join these communities, go to patreon.com slash therapy and help us finance the show. Again, we're a nonprofit show. None of us are getting rich off this. We are doing our regular jobs. Um, but this uh, helps us offset the costs of, of producing media and uh, getting the message out there, making sure we can do that for folks. So let's dive into the Therapods. We want to thank... Adam Petanuzo, Adam Rebiznik, Angie Ellis, Brad Kefauver, Brooks Lyle, Carolyn Albert, Chelsea Lamb, Chelsea Saracen, Corey Owens, Craig Little, David Sorensen, Don Dore, Elliot H. Lamb, Felicia Butler, Frozen Cusser, Gavin Bristow, where did I lose him? There it is. Ian Whitefall, I Have the Knack, James K., Jeffrey Ackerman, Jim Hunter, Joseph Pangrazio, Carrie Terhark, a.k.a. Nick Sister, Kate Keller, Katie Chiwai Chiwakowski. Nailed it. Kenneth Liu, Lauren Izzo in the Hizzo. Also check out the Mouthy Broadcast. Uh, that's a really fun podcast. I like that one a lot. Lori Eltsroth, Lindy Brandmeyer, Mats Lengren, Matthew Nayer, Malaya, Oki Scoop, Richard Bruins, Robert Paulson. His name is Robert Paulson. Roco, Sally Boop Scoop, Scoopaholic, Scoopatron, Scoopiter Ascending, Scoopstronaut, Scoopy Scoopy Jess Jess, Stacy Westerland, Tess Miller, Three Scoops a Lady, who asked that last question about life coaching, Todd Canfield, and Tracy Replogle, a.k.a. Bat Mom. My Mom. <laughs> By the way, do you have a picture of that? You're Bat to Mom. Mom. She never sent me a picture of her oh, Halloween thing. Dang it. Come on, Jim's mom. <laughs> Weak. And thank you to all our Theradactyls. Andrea Anderson, Brian Lehman, Dan Martin, David Polak, Fred Bashara Jr., Ice Blue Scoop, Ivan Elsa, Leon Kassab, Linda Bashara, Mason Miller, Rachel Dusto, Reverend Scoop Kevin, Ryan Stewart, Scott Brady, Scott Jameson, Slurpy Kaye motherfucker, <laughs> Tom Morrison, and Cindy Ash. And we want to thank the Saccharin 16, the mysterious and shrouded Illuminati members of the fan club, the Thera Producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Robert Brownie Jr. Mint, Kayla Lansbury, Elio Dare, Judy Schneider, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, Dr. Ben Don, and ex officio, oh, no, no, nope, no longer nope, ex officio, nope, 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 and nope. regular old member, <laughs> Crazy Banana Scoop. And if you'd like to hear this episode uncut and unedited and enjoy our spontaneous side projects, go to patreon.com slash therapy. And thank you for supporting mental health. That's all the time that we have for this week's session. We want to thank our landlords, the Ice Cream Social Podcast, and thanks to those of you who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Share this episode with someone who needs it by opening the episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link provided into your social media. Don't forget, you can find us at facebook.com slash podtherapy, on Twitter at podtherapyguys, on Instagram at podtherapyguys, and at patreon.com slash therapy. Do you want to submit a question to the show? Ask anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangerman. I'm a vegetable! Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week.